death row, a place in a prison that houses inmates who are sentenced to execution after being convicted of a capital crime. The first established death penalty laws date as far back as the 18th century BCE in the Code of King Hammurabi in Babylon, which codified the death penalty for 25 different crimes, including cheating on a spouse and helping people escape enslavement. The death penalty's use has spread throughout nearly every part of the world over the course of history, but a large majority of countries today have either abolished or discontinued the practice. Despite the extreme controversy of this topic in the US, which has led to many states abolishing it altogether, capital punishment still remains legal in 28 states with over 2,600 people currently on death row. In the last 50 years, nearly 9,000 people have been executed in the US by order of the government. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna to be sitting down with people sentenced with the death penalty who've been exonerated or expunged after being found not guilty. Are these death row exonerees able to live their free life to the fullest after losing years of their life to prison where they awaited execution for a crime they didn't commit? Or are they completely gutted by the wrongful accusation that sent them through years of physical and psychological torment at the hand of the justice system they once believed was built to protect them. Hello, Nick. How you doing, Anthony? Zarek. Hey, good evening, brother. How you doing, Anthony? Sonny and Peter. Hello, Anthony. Thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of death row survivors. Man, it's my pleasure to be here, brother. How would you describe yourself? A death row survivor? Someone who was found not guilty while awaiting a death sentence? Former death row prisoner. I guess death row survivors would be my choice, I suppose. Death row survivors sound great. I like that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you recall the events that led up to your death penalty conviction? In 1984, in Cincinnati, Ohio, a young man by the name of Gary Mitchell was working his family establishment. It was a nightclub called the Central Cafe in Cincinnati, Ohio. On August the 1st of 1984, two young men entered this establishment and attacked Gary. And uh, like eight days later, this young man passed away and died. And on October the 25th, a year later, I was sent to die for, for this horrendous crime, this horrible crime that I had nothing to do with. Why did this 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 murder get placed on you? We had a bunch of overzealous uh, police officers uh, taking the case, and it was a high-profile case. And they they didn't care who they charged with it. They crime. just needed to peg someone for this crime. Yeah, they needed to find somebody. In my case, they caught the guy. They caught a guy with the, the victim's personal belongings and all this money on him and gun. And we didn't notice the top that I had been sent to die. They caught the guy and they let the guy go. I was a 20-year-old drug addict living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1981. I was pulled over while intoxicated while operating a stolen car. Mm. I got into a scuffle with a police officer and it escalated to the point of his gun discharging. He told a huge lie about me and this lie was that I took his gun and tried to murder him. While I was incarcerated for these initial charges, I made up a lie about a local unsolved crime that was a murder in the area. The police figured out that I was lying, but they nevertheless used me to mop up a, a, an unanswered question of who did it. I told the police that a friend of mine had confessed to the crime, but I believed that that guy had died of a drug overdose, so I thought I was to get out and run away. Yeah. But it didn't work. So they were able to pin that crime on you in addition to the lie that the officer told about what you did when you were in that scuffle with them? It was all because of a prisoner who had burglarized the prosecutor's home who told them that I had confessed to him of the rape and murder of Linda May Craig, the woman in question. I was then taken to trial on my initial charges of attempted murder in 1982 against the word of a police officer and I was found not guilty. The police then sought the death penalty out of vengeance for me being acquitted of those original charges. So I was given a three-day capital murder trial and sentenced to die 
at the age of 21. I was just so desperate to get out from the initial lie of this police officer, I made up a lie of my own. In a 20 year old's mind, it, as soon as you got out the door, it would all go away. In Ireland, uh, on the 7th of July, 1980, there was a bank robbery in a town called Balahadreen in County Roscommon. And according to police, three men robbed the bank and made their getaway in a getaway car. And on a small country road at a crossroads, the getaway car collided with a police car. There was an exchange of gunfire and two police officers were killed. The three raiders escaped that same evening. One man was arrested on the side of the road with a bullet wound in his chest. Another man was arrested the following morning and the third man eluded them and they were searching cross country for him. The claim was that this man was me. 12 days after the event on the 19th of July, I was arrested in a house in Galway. I was 27 years old. I was a young mother of two young children. My husband at the time had asked a friend of his to give us a lift because our car had broken down in Florida. So we decided to pull over into a rest area. Police came to do a routine check of the rest area. I was at the time asleep in the back of the car with the two children. So the police report said that when they looked into the car, they saw a handgun between the driver's feet. They took him out of the car and asked for his ID and told him to stand aside. The man who, who from whom they confiscated the gun was actually on parole. So that changed everything. The policeman then drew his gun. He said, okay, nobody move. The next person to move is dead. And then there was gunfire. So I just covered the children. When it got quiet, I determined that we were still alive. And then I looked up to see if Jesse was okay. And he was just standing between the cars, like looking like shocked. The driver was running around the car with a gun in his hand, ordering Jesse to put us into the police car. I asked if he could just leave me and the kids there, we'd be fine. But um, Jesse explained, he said, listen, this guy has just shot two policemen. And if we don't go with him, he may kill us as witnesses. And you had proof that he was willing to shoot and kill. So now we became hostages of a man who just shot and later we found out killed the two policemen. There was a roadblock. He made this last minute decision to try to avoid the roadblock. And as he did, all the policemen at the roadblock with their rifles opened fire on the car. Oh my God. So again, I covered the children and we crashed. The only one who was actually injured was the driver. He was shot in the leg and yeah. he was taken away. Jesse was taken and handcuffed behind his back. And then the, all the policemen with their guns pointed them at me. I tried to explain that we had nothing to do with what happened, but all they knew was that two of their comrades were killed and that somehow all or one or whoever was responsible. They got in their heads that someone needed to pay for this. Oh yeah, actually what they did is they drove us to an unused portion of the railroad track where they got out of the car and were arguing among themselves whether to take us in or to simply kill us right there and say we had tried to escape. So you saw right there the corruption that, that you know, that this, this power that they felt they had over you to make decisions about whether you would live or die. Fortunately, the one that was arguing to take us in um, prevailed. Before we continue learning about the world of death row survivors. I survived a riot, multiple stabbings, being put into the cages with another men and made to fight that man for the uh, mere sport and entertainment of the prison guards. I had no fear of death, but I was afraid to die without dignity. I want to shout out and thank Witness to Innocence, the organization that helped us contact some of the guests in this video as they work to empower exonerated death row survivors. Witness to Innocence is the nation's only organization dedicated to empowering exonerated death row survivors to be the most powerful and effective voice in the struggle to end the death penalty in the United States. Through public speaking, testifying in state legislatures, media work, and active participation in our nation's cultural life, their members are helping to end the death penalty by educating the public about innocence and wrongful convictions. For more information, I'll go ahead and include a link to the Witness to Innocence website in the description below. Now back to the world of death row survivors. What was the interrogation and trial process like for you? It was awful, man. Saying you done something and you don't know nothing about what 
they saying you done, you you lost. You really can't say anything except I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. That's the only two things you could say is I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was very um, slanted. Mm -hmm. Everyone was just waiting the outcome. When I was sentenced to death, the jury took time from sentencing me to uh, convicting me to go out to the Wagon Wheel restaurant and eat dinner while they decided whether or not to put me to death. Over a dinner, they decided that a man that they didn't necessarily have the proper evidence for would receive death at the hand of the justice system that you were led to believe would protect you. And I watched all these people outside walking around I couldn't believe that they were all laughing and joking and having a great time. And there I was, 21 years old. I just got sentenced to death plus 60 years, so I was done. I was taken to the police station where I was remanded in custody, interrogated, uh, evidence fabricated against me, and I was brought before the non-jury special criminal court where I was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for capital murder and robbery. During the course of my trial, the police officer who had actually apprehended the man they were chasing and spoken to him, although the man then escaped from him. When asked did he recognize the man, he said he did. Would he see, did he see him again? He said, yes, he's in the court. He pointed up to the public gallery and he says, that's him standing up there with his back to the wall. Somebody else. Possibly the only person that would know for sure that it wasn't you clearly stated that it wasn't you and then nothing came about of that? That's correct. Why do you think it was pinned on you. Why were you even brought in in the first place? I had a political background. I was a political activist from the time I was 16 years of age. And so as far as the state was concerned, I was considered to be a subversive. So until they arrested a third man, the media could speculate as to what happened. And so they had to get closure. And I was a political activist, so they picked me up and framed me. Jesse's trial came first. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in four days. There wasn't a shred of evidence against him, except for the word of the killer. killer. Then my trial came up, and my trial lasted for two weeks. My lawyer said that we had no need to put up a defense. You were being told that being innocent was enough. Yes, and I, I thought so. Yeah, that's what we're led to believe, that the justice system will take care of those that are guilty and will free those that are innocent. He explained to me that by not putting up a defense, we, it would give him a better position in the closing argument. All you had to do was be yourself and they would see that you were obviously innocent. The judge had been a highway patrolman before he was a judge. So he'd been asked to recuse himself to, to, to not be the judge on our case because he couldn't possibly be impartial having been part of that brotherhood. But he refused right. to do that. You can do that? You can refuse to step down from a case that you're obviously going to have bias in? He did. And so each juror has to get up and say how they voted. When they said that they voted for life, the judge overruled them and vote census means death anyway. What? You can, you can just overrule, you can make an executive decision and decide, you know what? All this time that we spent deliberating, all, you know, the, the, the system that we have in place to ensure this doesn't happen, they can just overrule all of that. He was supposed to make a, a, a written, a proper written reason the for having reason. done so, a legal reason for having done so. Right. But he didn't. Everything that we're, we're taught to believe, it's really not there. It's not there to protect us in the way that we're, we're, we're told that, that it is. Systems are there to protect themselves. Did you have faith in the justice system before all of this played out? In minor things, it could go wrong, but not something as important as this. Right. It seems like it's rare when it goes wrong, right? People used to say, well, yeah, but you must have done something. I mean, the police don't just do that. Right, people who want more power don't ever abuse their power. People just make up their mind and they are gonna do it and they believe they're doing the right thing. Peter, did you have faith in the justice system at that time? No. <laughs> well, you were you were a political or you were you were an well, activist. You see, so. I had been an activist, and and I I, I had a, a critical and somewhat cynical view of the whole apparatus. Mm. Sometime previous to my being arrested, I was campaigning against the death penalty for two other people who had been sentenced to death. So the fact that you were against death row so so openly is almost what what led you to that 
point, ironically. It could be, yeah. Did you ever feel coerced into saying anything self-incriminating? I was taken to an interrogation room and two detectives came in and were trying to get me to say something that they wanted me to say. And every time I said, you know, you're trying to get me to say something that's not true, they would shut off the tape and then start again. Wow, clear manipulation over and over and over again. Cognitive, Cognitive bias. bias. They have a name for it now, but in those days, they didn't. But now we know that right. that's called cognitive bias, and you try to prove and find whatever it is that proves what you believe. Were you ever presented with a plea deal? Yeah, they offered me all kind of deals, but I went, I, 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 I couldn't take no deal because I didn't do it. If you sign these papers, and a lot of a lot of exonerees will tell you that, sign these papers, you could walk up out of here sky free because it keeps them from being reliable. You would sign these papers and that would that would be you basically saying, I'm guilty and I admit these things, but then you would in, in return get a, a lessened sentence and in this case being released from death row? If I would have signed them papers, they would have let me walk up out of this guy free. So you would still have that uh, conviction attached to you though for the rest of your life if you were to sign that? Yeah, yeah, you would. Do you remember the moment that you heard that, when you heard the judge say that you would be facing the death penalty? Oh, I knew I was convicted the day before when they showed photographs of the victim and members of the jury were crying. Anthony, they were hurrying home to go for the 4th of July holiday weekend. The judge told them, now I know that each and every one of you shares a grave concern that this trial will interfere with the 4th of July holiday weekend being only three days away. But I promise you this trial will be over in three days and we can all get to go home and celebrate. They were almost encouraging the jury to speed through this process, give you a conviction and go home and celebrate, regardless of the fact that they were putting a man that they did not have significant, sufficient evidence to prove that you were actually guilty and worthy of receiving the death penalty. I just turned 21 a few months before my trial. I was a kid. I wasn't no grown man. Can you explain what death row is like and how your day-to-day -day life generally played out? 24 hours a day of lockdown, knowing that you're going to die is hard. It was it, it, it was like being in hell, you know? You know, a lot of people have been in jail, but I wasn't in jail. I was in hell. They shut down the prison and walked me down this long corridor to death row. They opened up the door, and I remember when we walked in the death house, I could look over in the corner and see old Sparky. They called the old Sparky because, like I say, people had caught on fire in this chair, you know. And it's, it's like a bulletproof glass fixing with it. You could see the electric chair sitting there. So when you saw that electric chair, did you, did you, could you imagine yourself sitting there being executed on that chair? I remember, man, looking at that chair. It, 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 was, it was scary, man. And I had just been, been put, been sent to die and I was, I was a wreck, but when the guard said, dead man walking, I said, mm. I ain't dead yet. I was, he was being smart. It's almost like they're taunting you by saying dead man walking to people, letting you see the electric chair sitting there. And all you can do is imagine yourself being murdered at the hand of the justice system. I remained in solitary confinement um, for five years. I only got visits from my family four times a year during school holidays. I wasn't allowed any phone calls. I only got out of my cell twice a week for a brief shower and then maybe 15 minutes outside with a guard. I wasn't allowed to communicate with any other prisoners and then back to my cell for another three or four days, uh, give you back your white pajamas with your number and that's part of the dehumanization process is you no longer have a name you're a number i would spend the next 12 years on the hardest block in america i survived the riot multiple stabbings being put into the cages with another men and made to fight that man for the uh, mere sport and entertainment of the prison guards wow i witnessed people commit suicide i saw murders there it was just full on you were really put through as close to hell as one may ever see in their life. And yet I grew up there and my, 
became one of the most dangerous men they ever held because I cared about other men. So it was more of the, uh, the empathy that you, that you had that made you dangerous to these guards. Imagine that you can't write beautiful letters to your mother, but I can. Imagine that you aren't good at reading the law, but I'm really good at it. And I got two guys' sentences reduced to life imprisonment. And that turned everybody's head my way. Suddenly, everyone had one wanted me to help them. So if anyone did anything to me, the staff especially, there would be a full on outbreak of rage and uh, actions from men around me because I was so important to them. What were the psychological effects of counting down days to your execution while knowing full well that you were not guilty of the crime that you were accused of? I was sentenced to death on the 27th of November, 1980. The death sentence was to be uh, carried out on the 19th of December of that year, just three weeks later. While sitting on my bed reading a newspaper one day, I overheard three jailers discussing what role they might have to play in my execution. What role they would have to play? And they were talking about me as if I wasn't there, as if I didn't exist or I wasn't a human being. And apparently they had been told by their superiors that two jailers would have to participate in my being hanged. As if ha being hanged wasn't enough. And this made me enraged. As it should. <laughs> I realized that while they had me imprisoned physically, they couldn't imprison my mind or my spirit or my heart. And I determined that that's, those are the realms of myself wherein I would live in that situation. And that's what mm. I did. I came to the realization that I was not afraid to die. I had no fear of death. Really? But I was afraid to die without dignity. And I determined I wouldn't let them do that. There were only two books in my cell, a law book and a Bible. The law book was useless at that point in time, and I used the Bible as a book of wisdom. The Bible that made me realize that they don't actually get to say when I die, that's not really up to them, even though they had it written down and they had all the power. And so instead, I took back control of my life. I couldn't control my environment, I couldn't control where I was, but from right. here in I could control. It was the one area that you still had that control over. I used the only tools that I had, which was yoga and meditation and prayer. That became my trinity. While you were on death row, were you aware of any developments that were being made with your case that could eventually lead to your exoneration? I was the first man in the United States in 1988 to seek DNA testing. From prison. Yeah, I had no idea that over the next 15 years from that point, they would actively try to murder me. They destroyed all the autopsy material. When I had it located again, they absconded with it from a laboratory. They went on and on and on trying to murder me. Even though I was trying to use science to prove my innocence, I joined forces with Dr. Sir Alec Jeffries the inventor of DNA science. And from England, he guided me over 12 years, educating me on DNA so I could learn everything possible to defend myself in the courts. 11 days before my execution date, the state commuted my sentence to 40 years penal servitude without any possibility of parole. And can you explain how that change occurred? I was one day called out to the governor's office, Pringle. You're now doing 40 years. You're no longer sentenced to death. I said, on what authority? <laughs> yeah. And he said, on my authority. I said, okay. you don't have the authority to do that. He said, get out of here and get your <laughs> lawyer to contact me. And were you, were you given a reason for why it was changed from death to... From death to 40 years, just like that. And I was put out into the general prison population, which for a couple of days was grand. <laughs> and then I realized I couldn't face 40 years in that place. I determined that I was going to try and prove my innocence. Can you explain what, what went through your head when you realized that you were no longer going to be facing death by hanging in the coming weeks? It was a mixture. There was relief, of course, but I couldn't study because my anger was such that even reading my own case papers, my eyes would well up and I just, I just couldn't do it. And I knew I had to try to relax. So I asked a friend of mine to get me in a book on yoga. And I began to try to teach myself yoga in the cell. And gradually, 
I learned how to do yoga and gradually I was meditating and gradually my anger abated to such an extent that I was able to study. Mm. And that's what I spent the most of my time doing while I was in the prison. Other prisoners would come to me with their cases and ask me to look at their papers, which I did because when you're asked to help somebody, you do it sort of automatically nearly. But the second reason was by helping them, I was helping myself. I got a kind of a reputation in the prison as a jailhouse lawyer. In the nearly 15 years that I spent in the prison, I succeeded in helping 13 men to go get out of prison. You kind of became a hero in some ways. You let 13 other people have their innocence because you took that time to educate yeah, yourself. But they, I have to tell you that they weren't all innocent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but none of them were in prison in accordance with due mm. process, which meant in my eyes that they were unlawfully in prison. How long were you ultimately on death row before being found innocent? 8,057 days. Whew. How many years does that translate to, just for my sake? 23 years. I got sent to die October the 25th, 1985. I walked off the death row October the 25th of 2005. The same day, the same day, Anthony, the worst day of my life became the best day of my life. After 20, 20 years, years later. later. Exactly 20 years later. After five years, my sentence was changed from death back to life because um, the judge had overruled the jury uh, without giving a legal reason. And because my court-appointed attorney um, wasn't prepared to discuss the death penalty. By kind of... Um... Strange happenstance, you were, your penalty was changed? I was put into the population of the prison, which like Peter, for, for me, was like a celebration. It's like, woo, I can talk to people and I can go eat with people. And it was so great. And I could make phone yeah. calls home. I could call my children for the first time. At that moment, that felt like freedom, even though it was still obviously not. Oh gosh, it was, it was a lot better. Let's just put yeah, it that yeah. way. It was a lot yeah. better. After my sentence was changed, my parents decided that they would take a vacation that didn't involve bringing the children to visit prison, you know, because they, they didn't have to worry about me being executed anymore. That stress was no longer with them. They probably felt like they needed to be around to keep up with any change that might be occurring because they knew that you were potentially going to be ex executed at any moment. And, but, um, unfortunately, um, the, the plane crashed and they were killed. On their vacation to finally take that moment away, to take that breath of fresh air, knowing that their daughter was no longer going to be executed. Yeah, they were killed. So, thank God they, they left the children home, so they weren't with them. But it meant that now my children became orphans again, and I became an orphan too, and there was nobody outside anymore to to help with my case, to send me maybe a little money so I could get something. And it, that was definitely the worst day of my entire life, bar none. In the 15th year of our incarceration, Jesse received his third death warrant and that normally is fatal and it was for him. Um, but in his case, the electric chair malfunctioned and instead of dying when they pulled the switch and sent the electricity through his body, he caught fire. And they said, the, the, the witnesses said that flames shot out of his head from underneath the helmet and smoke came out. And they had to do this to him three times before he was finally pronounced dead. <sighs> One thing after another, which turned an already horrendous situation into something truly, truly, truly more devastating than anyone could ever imagine. About two and a half years after Jesse was executed, with the help of friends who never believed that I was guilty and the pro bono lawyers, they were able to win my habeas corpus, which meant that my sentence and conviction were overturned at that point. But like Peter, they threatened to give me a new trial. They weren't gonna let me go. How were you eventually proven innocent? Uh, 35 pieces of evidence, withheld 35 pieces of evidence. So they were able to prove that they purposefully withheld Pieces of evidence. 35 mm -hmm. pieces of evidence. You only need one piece of new evidence to get a new trial. Right. They would have 35 pieces. I went to court in January of 1992 
representing myself because I had no lawyer and I had no money. So, uh, and I was taking action under the constitution. In July, I won an order for discovery and of the state papers and the police papers in the case. And I had a job fighting for that one, uh -huh. but I won it. The basis upon which I was sentenced to death was after 34 hours of interrogation, one detec a detective sergeant claimed that in a particular interrogation, I had uttered these words. I know that you know I was involved, but on the advice of my solicitor, I am saying nothing and you'll have to prove it all the way. Words I never said, but he swore an oath. In the trial, he had kept a record of the interrogation and that I'd said these words. Uh huh. But when I got the photocopy of his notebook, it showed that he had entered the words into the notebook before the interrogation in which he claimed I said them. Wow. So it was clear that they had decided, they had no evidence against me, they decided to concoct evidence. And I had my conviction overturned. Uh, the state had asked for a retrial and I was remanded in custody to go before the special criminal court the following day mm -hmm. to face the same charge that they had already had overturned. I was brought into the witness box and I was asked if they gave me bail, would I um, turn up for my trial? Right. And I said, of course I would. So if, if the state are foolish enough to try and persist again, I said, I've already proved my innocence once and I can do it a second time. And so uh, they gave me bail and I was released. And a week later, the state dropped the case against me. We also uh, asked for discovery of anything we hadn't seen. At which point they delivered 10 boxes of material to my lawyers who, I mean, had to make a living besides my case. There was no way right. they could go through those boxes. But my friends, yeah. Mickey and Christy, they took those boxes to a hotel room and they started going through them. And first they found a report that the killer had passed the polygraph test that he, he was required to, to take in order to prove they weren't making the the bargain with the real killer. So my friends said, why would we believe that report? They've lied about so much. Let's hire yeah. a, a, a polygraph expert to examine the graph that actually came off the machine. They hired an ex-policeman. He discovered that the, he hadn't passed the lie detector test. Now, mm. I thought that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. They kept going until my friends found that one of the prison guards had overheard the guy bragging, confessing, and had submitted a written report about it. And that had been hidden from us all those years. So that stopped the hearings. And eventually I, I was released. It wasn't until I got sick with hepatitis from the beating that they gave me that I asked to be executed. So you actually we're at such a low point and so sick that you requested your own execution. So the federal courts at that point stepped in and demanded that all remaining DNA evidence be located in February of 2003. They got DNA from the killer's gloves left inside the car that belonged to the victim. And it was the first scientific evidence in the case indicating that DNA from unknown male number one was present. They would consume the remaining DNA in further testing, but it would be consumptive. Mm -hmm. And that if they, all of the evidence remaining didn't yield any evidence, they were going to go ahead and allow me, grant me my wish to be executed. So it was almost like because you wanted death, they were willing to look into it to prove that your death wasn't justified. I thought I was next. So I asked to have it accelerated by being executed. And I was granted the second round of DNA testing in July of 2003, proving my innocence. And they took me off death row. Do you remember the moment that you were told that you would be released and you would become a free man again? Man, like the heavens opened up <laughs> I'm on a cloudy day and the sun just come out. It felt like that day before Christmas when you know <laughs> You got all them toys out there. Your mom right. tell you, go to bed, go to bed. I had the happiest face you ever saw. Despite everything that you went through, you were still able to find that 
that moment to, to really experience and take in that joy. There's this one picture in a, in a newspaper of me, like right after they said it and they're taking off the handcuff. And I was like, oh, my face was so happy. Sometimes when I'm not feeling that great, I, I look at that picture and uh -huh, I can't uh -huh. help but be happy. Like that's, that's the best. What was the first thing that you did once you were freed? Went to eat at the Waffle House. <laughs> That's an official celebration it right the, there. It was the best food I ever had in my life. That food <laughs> tasted so good. And I, you know, I was used to eating garbage for 20 years. You're like, I had no idea a waffle could taste this good. One of the first things I did was to go to the sea because it felt like only the sea could be powerful enough to wash it away, almost like a baptism just mm -hmm. to wash it away and come out a completely new, clean person. I went and stayed with a f my friend who had uh, put up the bond for me. Got up in the morning, I was the first up. I went down to the kitchen. Everybody else in the house was still asleep. I went out to the back garden and it was a lovely long back garden. It was a beautiful day, sun shining, no walls around me, no barbed wire, the birds singing. And I walked down that garden and down at the bottom of that garden was a big apple tree, a big old apple tree. And I went to this big old apple tree and I put my hand on the trunk of the tree. As I was standing there, I began to think, you know, in all the time that I'd been in prison and all the things that had happened to me, this tree was growing quietly in this garden. Every year producing its fruit, shedding its leaves, hibernating for the winter, coming back in the spring and going through nature's way, irrespective of the big city all around it and the greed and the avarice and, and, and all that rat race stuff that was going on and the justice and injustice. And I put my arm around the trunk of the tree and I wept. And, and that was the first moment when I knew that I was free. How has your life changed most since death row? It's changed for the better because I'm like a teacher now, you know, I'm teaching yeah. the world about abolition. I'm teaching the world about injustice and the death penalty. And I also teach them about love and compassion. I tell them the reason I ain't angry and I'm always happy because I saw with anger. Them guards were angry when they mm. were taking my friends out of their cell and murdering them. Right. I would never want to act like that. That's why right. I'm so kind and I'm always smiling. What do you think was the most difficult part about assimilating back to normalcy again? 16 years of freedom been harder than death row. Why is that? Well, look at my life right now. I spent the last 16 years trying to free all these other men and help them. And I dedicated all my freedom to all this other stuff. And I didn't give myself a lot of time to heal. In June of this year, I drove across America with my family and I got Walter Ograd out of prison after 28 years. I met him in 1999 and I promised him back then I would get him out and I got him out this year. So you've spent your free time putting all your effort and energy into helping others who were falsely accused escape yeah, and it took a toll on my life. How do you feel about the U.S. being one of just 35 countries still practicing the death penalty today? I think that if the death penalty could be abolished in the United States, it would give impetus to a abolition of the death penalty in other countries. I went to Sweden at one point, and there was a man named Hans Jorn Frank who started Amnesty in Sweden, and I asked him what do you think would help to end the death penalty? And he said, when the U.S. ends the death penalty, then the rest will follow. Why do you think it is that the U.S. sets the precedent for the rest of the world? I still think the U.S. is a leader in, in mm -hmm. that way and can continue to be. And I do think that when the new president does away with federal executions, that the other states will follow. And I think it will be a huge step if there's anyone watching who's currently facing wrongful accusations of a crime they didn't commit, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? Innocent people make noise. If you really genuinely are innocent, that's what an innocent person wants. He wants to tell someone the truth. Mm -hmm. A guilty person just wants the system to maybe get it wrong or they're going to mm -hmm. tell stories about how they're innocent, but 
the facts don't really mesh. Testify for yourself. Because both Peter and I were told that we don't need to put up a defense. You don't need to take the stand. There's nothing against you. So there's no point in, in putting yourself through that. And it's, it was a mistake. And it is kind of painted the other way where it's like, if you try to defend yourself, then you're going to look like you have a reason to defend yourself. When in reality, it gives you a moment to kind of express your emotion and people to see that, that heart behind, that soul behind your eyes. And as Sonny says, if you, if you come to trial and you're, in the, and, you, and you're there, and no matter what your lawyers say to you, Mm. Go into the witness box on oath and tell the truth. What do you think is the biggest misconception about people who have served time on death row? You know that of all the people released from death row, none of them have gone out and committed murders. All of them are sweet, loving, amazing people because we take what we now have so precious, we don't want to spoil it. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. I love y'all, man. God bless y'all. And let's end the death penalty in America. It's called sunnycenter.org. And then you can get in touch with us and you can read about it, and buy our books. Sunday Center Foundation, which is the foundation we established, which is there to help people who have been wrongfully convicted after they are released from prison. Hi, I want you to share this as much as you possibly can. That's all I want. Take my grandson's advice and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonny and Peter. I feel like I understand the world of surviving death row just a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. After spending the day with these death row survivors, I've come to understand that while we want to believe in the efficiency of our justice system, we should never assume an accusation or sentence is accurate or even true without considering all possibilities. We can only hope and routinely vote to ensure that our system continues to grow more fair and more just over the course of our lifetime. See you later, bye guys. Press the like. Did you two meet um, in your work in advocating for, for others to, uh, to not experience the same things that you both did? Yeah, I was marching against the death penalty through Texas. Some people from, uh, from Ireland that were part of Amnesty International were there and they heard my talk and they invited me to come. Steve Earl, he said to me, when you go to Ireland, you got to meet <laughs> Peter Pringle. And with a name like Peter Pringle, you got to go to Ireland and meet Peter Pringle. <laughs> yeah, okay, but he told me nothing about Peter. Uh -huh. So when I got there, somebody else said the same thing and gave me his number, and I called him, and I invited him to come to my talk. And the door opened over the far side, and this little lady walked in, and I walked over to her, and I said, uh, you must be Sonny Jacobs. I said, you must be Peter Pringle. <laughs> <laughs> the sheer amount of strength that it required to get you through, and the hope that that was required to get you through all of these extremely devastating events ended up in some ways with this match made in heaven this this perfect serendipitous moment where you both realized that you both lived very similar lives and now despite everything that you went through you can now live your life together with all of that strength put together to uh, form this bond and this this family together it's our gift it's our gift and 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 we're we're blessed